Welcome to the first lecture on energy. In this lecture, we're going to get into the basics of energy by talking about world energy consumption, production, and the history of energy. We're going to start with a little bit on energy and geopolitics. The world of energy is constantly changing. In fact, this uh, this online lecture is very likely going to have to change within the next year or so just because of the rapid change in the demand of energy and the rise of nations that are demanding the energy. One of the big factors out there in the energy world is the rise of Asia and how the rise of Asia and its demand, notably China and India, and their demand for energy and how that relates to how we're viewing the geography and the politics of the world is very interesting to note. And I have a link to an article in there on the rise of Chinese and Indian demand for energy and how that relates to us. The rise of natural gas is another interesting factor in geopolitics because with the rise of natural gas consumption and production within our own country we're having a very very different look on where and what areas of the world are important to us in a geopolitical and geopolitical strategic sense. This gets into the domestic energy movement. I encourage you to look into the domestic energy movement as there is controversy with it in terms of the drilling techniques and methods associated with it and where are we going to get our domestic energy. But one of the biggest proponents for it is T. Boone Pickens. I have a link to the Pickens Plant website and I also have a link to a TED Talk here that T. Boone Tickens delivers. So where are we right now? Why is gas so expensive? Who is to blame for this? Is it the President of the United States? Is it the oil companies? What's going on? Well, as much as a lot of conspiracy theories are out there on this, it really gets out to down to demand and speculation. I have this graph over here that shows you how way back in 2008 when gas was around two dollars a gallon it was because before that, remember, it was pretty high in, in the uh, 2007 and that plummeted. This was due to a global recession. This is when we were in the heart of a recession. Um, this had repercussions on China and India around the world. Very few countries out there, or states for that matter, were recession proof. That led to a lowering demand of energy and, of course, the lowering of the cost. To look into this further, you can look at how, in all actuality, the United States is importing less oil now than ever before in its history. And we're producing more oil and natural gas now, be, be, now more before than ever. And then finally, if you want to look at this in terms of energy demand, you can look at how different countries around the world are experiencing an increasing demand for energy that increase in demand has led to higher prices. Of course you do have speculation that occurs in the oil market as well. So if you want to know what's going on a great source for this is the oildrum.com. I encourage you to take a look at that and see uh, the oil drum is it's more or less a huge collection of different blogs out there and those blogs are um, a means for all these different analysts who are strong in the industry to get together and do that. These are the different contenders. I'm not going to go through these links, but these are all different videos on YouTube uh, from all the different people out there that are looking to provide us energy. This is a series on the, on the U.S. power grid. This is a part of your final quiz. This is an, this is a, also in the assignments I bring this up. I give you this link. This is to a bunch of maps on there. You're going to want to know those maps. But also this is the first story and then the remainder of the series on the U.S. power grid. It's a great series because it shows you how antiquated our power grid is and what we're doing to move forward to make that into a smart grid. Here's a quick assessment of what you know. I want you to flick through these slides or look at these as I'm going through this and see if you know the answer to these questions. If you don't, you want to look it up or pay attention to the lectures because you'll figure this out as these lectures are finished. This one is very interesting because it does relate to 
Asian countries. This is very interesting. Okay. Let's move on. Take a break if you want. Hit pause. And let's now, after you're done with that, let's move into U.S. energy needs and usages by looking at a short history of energy types. We're going to start with this slide. This is a very interesting slide because it shows you how energy use has changed with time and how advancements in technology, prohibitive costs of other energy sources have really changed through time and it's led to different forms of energy being prominent in the past. What we want to take a look at first is coal. Coal was in 1712 as the first steam engine. Of course it was uh, highly to be modified by Watts, but in 1712 in Newcastle, England, they were mining coal for the Industrial Revolution, which was in its first beginnings. Unfortunately, they were kind of at a standstill because the coal that they're extracting from the earth was the mine shafts were getting flooded. A lot of people were dying trying to get the coal out of the ground for the revolution to, to well, not the revolution, for industrial production to take place. And so this individual designed a steam engine to pump the water out of the coal mines to make it to where we could extract coal. And that led to a rapid rise in coal. Well, if you take a look down here, you'll see that petroleum, even though petroleum is the leader in the world economy, petroleum really wasn't in heavy demand until the early 1900s. Well, here we have oil wells in 1859 being drilled, but oil, its first use was really, it was related more to petroleum for lamps, kerosene lamps. And the kerosene lamps actually replaced oil lamp, or whale oil lamps because the whale oil was becoming prohibitively expensive from overhunting of whales. It wasn't until Henry Ford came up with the, with the uh, mass-produced Model T vehicle and Winston Churchill converted the British Navy over to, to uh, oil, and then of course the United States and other countries following suit, that you saw a rapid demand in petroleum. And you can see how that demand exceeded coal right around here, right around 1950. Now how natural gas relates to petroleum in the future is going to be something that's very interesting to look at. If we look at 2007 versus now, this is a 2007 estimate. And I point this out because this is why the world of energy is constantly changing. You take a look at this, and what you see is that this was made in 2007. You can see here that their projection has us going up in our consumption of oil, or just energy, I should say, but our production not really going up too much. What we know since then is that this is completely inaccurate and our energy production has gone up significantly. Now how is our consumption going to go up? Nobody knows. Maybe conservation measures will change that. You look at this by source, you can see that our production uh, by source, we produce a lot of coal, natural gas, and oil. Liquefied natural gas this is a little different. This is where you compress it into a liquid form. You have nuclear, you have hydroelectric, geothermal, solar power voltaic, photovoltaic energy, biomass, and wind. Where wind and photovoltaic solar energy is going to go, that's another one that's going to be very interesting. When you look at this broken down, here's 2006. You have your renewable energy sources. What's going to be very interesting with these in the years to come is what's going to happen with wind and solar because globally these things are growing at a very rapid rate. Within the United States, these things have grown significantly since 2006. Where that goes in the rise of natural gas and to increase domestic production of petroleum is still up in the air. Worldwide, the figures somewhat match the United States in that you have oil as the leader for consumption, you have natural gas, and then you have coal. In terms of energy consumption by sector of the economy, what you'll see is that coal overall is used as a utility to produce electricity. 
little bit of industrial that's changed, though with time it used to be very much an inverse of this. Oil, you see a huge chunk of it is transportation. By far the number one user of oil is transportation. How that's going to change with time with the rise of electric vehicles, natural gas vehicles, and the like, this is going to be very interesting to see. Then finally, natural gas, you see that only a very small slice of it is in transportation right now, but a big chunk is in residential for home heating and cooking, gas stove and the like. Here we have some energy use trends, and I'm pointing this out because this is pretty interesting in how it relates to geopolitics and geopolitical events. You see these two dips in here. These two dips are related to the oil embargo of the 1970s from OPEC nations upon the United States and non-OPEC countries. Following those embargoes, the price of oil went up significantly because of the increased demand of of the energy and it being in short supply. So what happened in the United States was in both of these times we actually engaged in energy conservation measures and we looked into making energy appliances, cars, all those types of things, heat homes more insulated, uh, heaters more efficient. We, we pursued that but then in each case we, we somewhat forgot about these moments and then our energy use went up with time. We take a look at this graph. This graph is interesting because it shows per capita energy use in gross national product. Generally speaking, the higher the gross national product, the more energy an, an economy uses, a country uses. Energy fuels a nation's economy. Now we do have outliers on that. We have the UAE which is way crazy up here, doesn't really have that high of a GNP. They use a lot of energy. This is where you know Abu. Um, this is this is where you have the tennis courts on the roof. You have the fake islands. You have indoor ski places. Lots and lots of energy surrounding them. Uh, very much a financial capital of the uh, oil world. And so it, it's kind of an outlier. And then of course you have here you have Japan and Switzerland both high GNPs but in both cases they don't have domestic energy production so their energy use is, is very low. Energy at least in the form of the traditionals natural gas, oil and coal comes from fossil they're fossil fuels and they come from what are known as sedimentary basins and these sedimentary basins lie in certain areas of the world. You can see one right here in the heart of the United States you can see one here in, in the northern tip of South America. You can see uh, large collections of them in China and both China and Russia and of course in Europe. What's very interesting with these is that for the most part it relates a lot to where geopolitical events in the world, uh, notable points in history, uh, more of the wealthy nations of the world, a lot of this corresponds. Uh, there's some readings where this is discussed in a little bit more detail in terms of what's known as a petro dictatorship and how a petro dictatorship in a lot of ways is fueled by our demands for oil. So of course these are sedimentary rock basins. This is where you find fossil fuels. You don't find them in igneous rocks, you don't find them in metamorphic rocks, you find them in sedimentary rocks. Let's talk about natural gas. Natural gas has different forms. It ranges from being very simple in the form of methane all the way all the way to being very complex in the form of butane. And there's even more complex forms than that. It's cleaner than both petroleum and coal, if you want to look at this from a climate change perspective. It's predominantly used for residential cooking and heating, although you you do see its use for electrical generation. This is often for on-demand electrical generation when you need a little spike in power. Automobiles do see the use, although I have a feeling that you're going to see more and more automobiles using natural gas in the future. This is uh, just a slide that shows you the reserves of both oil and gas. What you can see here is that Russia definitely is sitting on quite a bit of natural gas. And this figure, this is from 2011, this is, this is likely going to have changed a little bit because of the different uh, new natural gas reserves that were announced in many countries of the world, including ours.
here we have uh, just a quick figure on that. You can see that Russia does lead the world. Here goes our natural gas basins. Notice how you have this following those same sedimentary basins that were in the previous slide. Here we have our oil and natural gas production. You can see that oil and natural gas production takes place within our own sedimentary basins. We also have a fairly well-developed oil and gas natural infrastructure. This is one of the other reasons why there's a lot of proponents to bring us over to natural gas and in terms of our bridge field because a lot of our infrastructure is in place. This is a very controversial topic, uh, the rise of natural gas production in our country. And it, it, it hits us here in Wisconsin, in the upper Great Lakes for that matter, uh, for the fact that in this new form of natural gas production, and petroleum production for that matter, you're seeing uh, use of what's known as hydrofracturing. And hydrofracturing is, uh, in essence, you're, you're, you're cracking the rock to allow the gas or the, the product to flow through to where before it couldn't because there wasn't enough permeability, the ability for the material to flow through the rock. One of the products that you use in hydrofracturing is a sand that's well-rounded and well-sorted. We happen here in, in Eau Claire and our surrounding area to sit on rock that's very conducive for that. And so there's a lot of these uh, frac sand mines getting put in place. The frac sand mines are not without controversy. I encourage you to, uh, to look into this. Unfortunately, with this being an e-lecture, in an introductory class. I can't really get into it in more detail, but I do encourage you to look into the issue and uh, get an informed side of, get be informed on the topic before you start drawing conclusions and drawing battle lines. Methane hydrate is another form of natural gas that has a lot of major potential and it's no longer just theoretical. Uh, Japan this gets into geopolitics again. Japan just successfully extracted methane hydrate from the bottom of the ocean. It forms in really, really deep ocean basins along active plate boundaries. And if you look over in here, you can see that Japan is surrounded by this resource. And now that they have the technology to do it, it's going to be very interesting to see what's going to happen with Japan in terms of its energy consumption and economic growth for that matter now that they have right within their own borders a massive pool of energy to work with. Let's move into coal though. Coal is abundant. There's also a lot of it. Even within the United States we're over 200 years of proven reserves. It's used to make electricity, and the United States, along with the world, uses a lot of it for electricity. The United States is the global leader in coal. We have more than anyone else in the world. And I should say that not all coal is equal. Uh, coal varies in its quality in terms of how many impurities are in it and how hot it gets when you burn it, and but also that and how it, well extracted. Uh, some places it's very easy to extract. You just kind of scrape off the surface and you can just yank it right out of the ground. Other places it's pretty far in. Oh, in uh, this area, they used to mine for it with tunnels. Now they're just removing the tops of mountains to do it. And you can see over here how it goes in different grades. Lignite is very, very poor quality. There's lots of impurities. It doesn't burn very hot. And you get all the way up in here into anthracite. Anthracite is actually a very hot burning, very few impurities. It's almost a metamorphic type rock. In terms of power from coal, what you want to take a look at here is that China is now well past the United States in terms of its coal power production. This is uh, kind of the unthinkable because even as early as the year 2005, they, were, they weren't predicting China to surpass the United States, I think, until 2014. Ch not only has China passed us in its coal production for electricity, but if you take a look over here, you can see that they're projected to put in even more plants 
as we're taking plants out of production. Here is a web link to power from coal if you want to take a look at it. But if you just take this by world the coal consumption by region, you can see that China is by far the biggest and projected to be, for that matter, the biggest user of coal. This has a lot of people in the climate change worried realm worried because you see this massive pool. This is uh, not even taking into account what might happen in a place like India with economic growth, and that you have other countries that are phasing coal out while other ones are phasing it in. Coal is nasty. I try to refrain from too much of my opinion in here, but coal is just a terrible, terrible substance. Not only does it produce carbon dioxide, it produces nitrous dioxide, sulfur dioxide. The sulfur dioxide can react with water to form sulfuric acid. It's the largest form of CO2 emissions. Its direct waste and waste products include all sorts of nasty things, heavy metals, you name it. And it's also a radioactive substance. This coal waste is, is it has to be treated as nuclear waste. It, it often slides under the radar, but this, this coal waste, and I'm not talking about what's put in the air, I'm talking about what's left over after it burns, is a sludge that is, it's a low, it's a, it's a, it's a low level radioactive waste. So, how do you use coal and make it less polluting? Well, the ultimate goal is clean coal technology. However, I will say that this is theoretical. You can reduce coal emissions, and I'll re revisit this in a little bit. There's a way to reduce emissions. One of them is to wash coal, and this is really getting rid of the sulfur dioxide within the coal. And this is how you wash coal. You pretty much put it through a, a massive washing machine. With clean coal technology, there's gasification. And you can gasify coal and turn it into a gas and then burn the gas. So you're not really directly burning the coal. That really cuts back on the amount of impurities and particulates put in the air. You can put scrubbers on the smokestacks. But this really isn't clean coal technology because all of your gas emissions are still going into the air. This syn gas is actually was a lot of the technology for this was developed in, during World War II by the Germans when they were short on uh, gasoline. They they uh, advanced quite a bit of research in turning coal into gasoline, and you, you you hear that actually right. Well, you heard a lot more of it when. Uh, when the price of oil was really high and we weren't domestically producing, we were, you heard a large debate of using our coal to create gasoline, which, yes, you can do. But clean coal technology in terms of no um, zero emissions is theoretical. You can reduce the particulate emissions, but you cannot capture and store the carbon. The technology is there. It's, it's done in different natural gas fields around the world. In fact, oil production fields do this uh, to drive oil out of the ground. There, there are some areas where carbon dioxide and impurities in natural gas is injected underground, but these are areas very, very far from any area, and it's done at a limited scale that you wouldn't have with something like a power plant. It's done in areas where this, you have sedimentary rock or rock that is porous enough to, to hold this stuff. Not all bedrock is conducive for it, but it's not yet being implemented mainly because of litigation, because nobody wants to be legally responsible for that CO2 if it leaks out of the ground. Because what it can do is asphyxiate or suffocate people who can't breathe. So if you have a bunch of holes where you have a crack in the ground that leaks out and you're the coal company, you're, you're, you don't want to be held liable for that for obvious reasons. So there you have your clean coal technology, what it would look like. This is actually going on right now, I should say, but with utilities, no, you don't have this stuff going on. Here are some questions related to your readings that you're going to want to visit and make sure you understand before we conclude. If you're not understanding these questions, you may want to revisit your readings.